Welcome to a Level 1 Plus Training TTE video. The aims of this trans thoracic echo are to answer five simple questions. What is the LV function? What is the RV function? Is there a pericardial effusion? Is there any gross valvular pathology? And what is the volume status of the patient? Before we begin, it's important to understand the movements of the probe. Tilting the probe is moving the tail up and down through the longitudinal plane. Angling the probe is moving the tail across the short plane of the probe. Rotating the probe is either rotating in a clockwise or anti-clockwise direction. Before you begin, it's important to position the patient in the left lateral position with their left arm bent up to support their head and their right arm resting alongside their body. Hold the probe in your left hand in between your thumb and your index and middle finger, ensuring that you anchor your hand on the patient's chest, either with the ulnar surface of your hand or your other three fingers. The parasternal long axis. Position the probe marker towards the patient's right shoulder. Start in between the third or fourth intercostal space in the left parasternal position and continue to move down a rib space until you can achieve an adequate view. You may need to get the patient to take a full breath out to collapse the lung to improve your image. It's important to visualize where the heart may be positioned within the chest and direct your ultrasound beam towards the heart. So once you obtain an image, optimize it with not only your nobology, but also small movements of the probe, which may require a bit of angling, tilting and rotating to ensure that the aorta or the aortic valve and mitral valve are on view as well as the left ventricle and the long axis, with the cavity open to show the widest possible distance. You should not see the apex of the heart. A rough rule of thumb is that the aortic root and left atrium should be a one-to-one -one ratio. Make an assessment of all the cavities that you can see. Have a look at the left ventricle. Make an assessment on its size the wall thickness, and the contractility of the walls. Normally, the wall thickness should increase by 50% during systole and contract towards the centre of the cavity, obliterating the third of the cavity. Make an assessment of the right ventricular size and contractility. Have a look at the pericardium, which lies behind the heart, in front of the descending aorta, but behind the infralateral wall of the left ventricle. A pericardial effusion will be seen in this position. Anything distal to the descending aorta is likely to be a pleural effusion. Make an assessment of the mitral valve and the aortic valve looking at the morphology, leaflet movements, and apply colour flow Doppler to assess for any gross valvular regurgitation. When zooming in on the left ventricular outflow track, make an assessment of the size by measuring at leaflet insertion or one centimetre proximal to leaflet insertion, the distance at its widest point, which is usually in early systole. The parasternal RV inflow view is achieved by tilting the probe down, directing towards the patient's right hip from the parasternal long axis. Here you can make an assessment of the right atrium, right ventricle and tricuspid valve. Again, 
observe the leaflet movement and apply any colour flow Doppler to assess for gross valvular regurgitation. If there is any gross valvular regurgitation, try to align a continuous wave Doppler parallel to the jet direction to make an assessment of the velocity. By applying the modified Bernoulli equation, you can then estimate the pressure gradient between the right atrium and the right ventricle, and then adding the right atrial pressure will give you an estimate of the right ventricular systolic pressure, which is equivalent to the pulmonary systolic pressure. The next view is a parasternal short axis view at the level of the aortic valve. From the long axis, rotate the probe clockwise through 90 degrees with the probe marker pointing towards the patient's left shoulder. You should first see at the level of the aortic valve on a short axis and have a look for that Mercedes-Benz sign in a tricuspid aortic valve. You'll also see the right ventricular inflow and right ventricular outflow wrap around the aortic valve. Zoom in on the aortic valve to make an assessment. Apply colour flow Doppler to all valves to look for any gross valvular regurgitation. The next view, a parasternal short axis at the level of the mitral valve, is achieved by tilting the probe more inferiorly towards the patient's left hip. Here you'll see the mitral valve on a short axis where you can have a look at leaflet movements of both the anterior and the posterior mitral leaflet. And it's important to apply colour flow Doppler to make an assessment of any gross valvular regurgitation. Have a look at the left ventricular contractility and wall thickness, making any observation of regional wall motion abnormalities. The parasternal short axis mid papillary view is achieved by tilting the probe even more inferiorly down towards the mid cavity of the left ventricle. Make an assessment of the left ventricular wall thickness, contractility and look for any gross regional wall motion abnormality. Again, have a look at the pericardium lying around the heart to see if there's any obvious pericardial effusion. The apical four-chamber view, it's important to position the patient in that same left lateral position and imagine the lie of the heart, putting the probe at the apex of the heart, i.e. where the apex beat may be felt, and having the marker pointing towards the bed or about three o'clock. To ensure that your image is not foreshortened, and by that I mean that you're imaging through the apex of the heart up through to the base, Start as low and lateral as you can, moving up a rib space until you can visualise the apex of the heart. In the apical four chamber, make an assessment of all the chambers, the left and right atrium and the left and right ventricle. The right ventricle normally should about be about two thirds the size of the left ventricle. Have a look for any gross valvular pathology and make assessment of the systolic function of both ventricles, particularly looking for any obvious regional wall motion abnormality. The apical five chamber view is achieved by tilting the probe more anteriorly so that the ultrasound beam is directed more anteriorly in the chest wall towards the aortic valve, which is an anterior structure within the thorax. By placing a pulse wave in the left ventricular outflow track, you can measure the velocity time integral by tracing the area under the curve. One can then calculate the stroke volume by applying the area that was measured of the left ventricular outflow tract in your parasternal long axis.
The apical two chamber is achieved by rotating the probe in an anti-clockwise direction from your apical four chamber, whilst trying to maintain the same ultrasound trajectory through the apex of the heart until you can see both the anterior and the inferior walls of the left ventricle. Again, make an assessment of any gross valvular pathology and have a look at the left ventricular wall contractility to see any obvious regional wall motion abnormality. The apical three chamber view is achieved by rotating the probe further in an anti-clockwise direction with the probe marker ultimately pointing towards the patient's right shoulder. This is the same view as the parasternal long axis, however it's now viewed from the apex of the heart. Apply colour flow Doppler to both the mitral and the aortic valves to make an assessment of any gross valvular pathology. Sometimes the Doppler alignment is much more parallel in the left ventricular outflow track for this view and you may want to put a pulse wave Doppler in the outflow track again to measure the stroke volume. Make an assessment of any obvious regional wall motion abnormality. The subcostal four chamber, position your patient in the supine position and try to get them to relax their abdominal muscles. You can achieve this by ensuring that the patient's head and neck are completely relaxed and flat and have their hips bent and knees flexed. Hold the probe in between your thumb and index finger, but change the position of your hand to now being above the probe so that you can apply pressure to the probe against the abdominal wall of the patient. Place the probe in the sub region with the probe marker towards 3 o'clock. Tilt the probe anteriorly and direct your ultrasound beam in between the suprasternal notch and the left clavicle. Have a look at this four chamber view, again assessing every chamber. Look at the size of the atria and size of the ventricles. Look for any gross valvular pathology or any regional wall motion abnormality. Particularly focus on the interatrial septum as it's now perpendicular to the ultrasound beam and any PFO or ASD will be visible by applying colour flow Doppler as the flow in between the atria is now parallel to the ultrasound beam. This is also often a simple view to exclude a pericardial effusion. From the subcostal four chamber view, rotate your probe anti-clockwise through 90 degrees with the probe marker now pointing to about 12 o'clock. By tilting the tail of the probe superiorly with the ultrasound beam directed through the abdomen to the IVC, you'll be able to visualize the IVC in a long axis draining in to the right atrium. You can measure the size of the IVC, usually at about one centimetre proximal to the hepatic vein. You can estimate the right atrial pressure in a non-ventilated patient by determining not only the size, but the variation in the size with respiration or a quick, short, sharp sniff. That is the completion of a level one plus study.